Hello. Good morning, Mr. Rosenthal. Hi. Hi. Sorry Hi. I'm late. It's no, hard. you're not. Yes. Never, it's never done and it's never wrong. We, we love it. It's great. Thank you for That's joining us. I always tell my employees. That's right. Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm going to join you all by sparking up my doobie. Yeah, that's what you should do. Uh, so first of all, I think you, want, you have something you want to say, right, Joe? I want to thank you. My pleasure. I want to thank you so much for everything that you and others have done to get us to where we are today. Without you and being willing to go to jail, we would not have the backyard medicine that we have today in California. Yes, legalization. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people taking credit for it right now. A lot of politicians taking credit for uh, the legalization of cannabis movement. All the Democrats. Uh, and uh, no, none of them would be where they are right now without you and uh, the history of this. So just uh, really, we are sincerely thank you so much for what you've done to get us here so that we can do this here in California uh, in our limited, our limited freedom. Yeah, we're not quite tomatoes yet. We would love the tomato model. Uh, that and really, that's kind of our first question. Can you? Uh, we talk about that all the time. That it should be like tomatoes. What is the tomato model, and and what do you? How do you think cannabis should be regulated, if at all? Um, you know, I think that uh, customers have the right to have uh, clean, uh, healthful um, products, mm -hmm. no matter whether it's uh marijuana or any other product absolutely and certainly marijuana is being regulated in terms of health uh more severely than anything that we eat or or uh touch and and um, um on the one hand i think that that's a good thing and on the other hand i want you to think of all the people that you know it had to go to an emergency room for marijuana. <laughs> or all the people who uh, had got some sort of illness because of marijuana. Now, yeah, because of all the pesticides and all of the, everything that's been in there for years. No, think about it. You don't know anybody who is, actually, who is actually where they can say this person has been affected either by the pesticides or by unclean marijuana or gotten a disease, even HIV patients who have a, uh, a, um, uh, a compromised immune system. None of those, you, don't, you just don't hear about it. True story. Nevertheless, I think that testing isn't a bad thing. As far as regulating um, how, uh, how it's distributed. The problem that the state has is this, that with almost all products, except maybe some vegetables, and I mentioned tomatoes, um, almost everything that we get in the United States comes to us through a hub and spoke system. And the hub is the manufacturer or the distributor. And then it goes to the retailers and then it goes to customers. So for instance, cars, there are only a few car manufacturers and they sell to a few distributors and then it goes to you, right? To, or now there are some products that there are multiple, especially farm products, that there are multiple uh, sources. So with tomatoes, there are, are companies that are involved in tomatoes from every level, from international distributors through national uh, uh, farms that are owned by large national corporations to local farmers, to backyard gardeners, to uh, people who uh, uh, have uh, you know, on a country road that might have some baskets out and say, leave, leave $5 for a basket. So, 
And so that there are multiple sources. It, instead of being a hub system, it's more of a combination of a hub and uh, a network where um, small amounts are being distributed to small numbers of people on a local level, and then there's larger distribution. So on the other hand, the majority of tomatoes that are consumed in the United States are grown by home growers. And so I think that, that uh, the reason why there's always going to be a non-regulated market for marijuana is that it is a network system mm -hmm. and not regulate every segment of a network system can only regulate like the main hubs. And uh, that would be like, for instance, the, the uh, legal marijuana shops of one sort or another. Right. You regulate that, but you can't regulate that neighbor to neighbor system or a small dealer system or even large, um, larger systems. And well, so we see a, and we see a push of the corporate cannabis move now to basically, you know, in New York City, the example where uh, MedMen and a, that group, the, the vertically integrated monopoly in New York saying, don't allow home grow in your legalization efforts. Well, if you want to stop home cultivation, do use the program they have in Oregon, where you can go and buy an eighth for five or ten dollars. Well, what home cultivator would grow their own? when you can buy the best eighth for ten dollars, you know, for eighty dollars an ounce. So just right. That, right? Then you'd stop home cultivation. Well you don't sound too threatened by the whole corporate cannabis movement, uh, because it's not backyard growing is not gonna go anywhere. Well how do we stop the the uh, well, pro persecution? I I, um, I have a more uh, encompassing one. See I think that the US has always been two things. It's always been war, a warring country, mm -hmm. a warrior country. Yeah. And it's always been alcoholic. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was alcoholic from the time that it, before, from the time it was colonies and it was warlike. You know, first it fought off Native Americans. Yeah. Colonies fought colonies, for instance. The Vermont Green Mountain Boys, they were not meant to protect against uh, British or anything. They were meant to protect against New York State incursions. Mm -hmm. So they, the colonies fought each other. They fought Native Americans. They fought uh, the French, the Spanish. Then since the United States has been formed, there hasn't been a day in its existence and there hasn't been a military action. Yep. Sorry. We are fighting in 14 countries right now. Yes, sir. We have uh, uh, um, uh, military bases in 130 or 140 countries, uh -huh. countries that you couldn't even name. It's the one bipartisan issue <laughs> that they all agree on. <laughs> War well, is essential. And, and, it's all, and it's, and I think that it goes hand in hand with an alcoholic policy. Mm. And so I want to change this into a cannabis centric country. I love it. And so to do that, we need pot for pennies. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm not as concerned with um, the means of distribution as getting it so cheap that when people say, well, we want to get intoxicated in one way or another, that they choose cannabis because it's cheaper than alcohol. Wow. And what I'd like to see is I'd like to see the real cost of alcohol being um, put on the consumer. And what I mean by the real cost of alcohol, I think all alcohol should be taxed to at least not only... Um, fill coffers a little bit, but also pay for all the medical and uh, the medical and criminal problems that alcohol creates. I'm not just talking about uh, about uh, 
the cost of arrest. I'm talking about serious problems. Yes. Like, medi uh, so, like Alzheimer's disease. And the, like same thing disease. With tobacco, the same thing with tobacco. So yes. given that, the price of a uh, pack of cigarettes might swell to like $30, $35. Right. And, yeah. and uh, same thing with alcohol. I mean, yeah. you can buy a, a bottle of wine for $3 in Trader Joe's. Right. So, but what's right. the cost of that in, in terms to society? Yeah. And then if you tax cannabis even as an asset to society, but um, because it has very little cost, mm -hmm. you, would, you would find that uh, alcohol, uh, that cannabis is far cheaper as a, as a consumer product and alcohol or tobacco. And yeah. that's what I'd like to see happen. That would be um, amazing. Happening in Oregon, I think it's a great thing. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, I'm not saying kids should use. Uh, right. Or, but you know that, um, that especially uh, males 16 to 24 have a propensity for uh, reckless behavior. And so, I much rather see uh, uh, people in that uh, in that age bracket choose cannabis and alcohol. Yeah, one hundred percent. More or less likely to get into trouble or to hurt themselves. Right. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so, one of the ways of doing that is finance. The financial aspect of it. That is. Well, let's see. Between us, we have twenty dollars. So, should we get buy some uh, beer, or are we going to get some joints? Yeah. So uh, that's I want that as an economic decision. I want it to be a no-brainer, and that's why I say pot for pennies. So okay. people are so concerned about the, you know, the old growers. You know, well, here's the thing about it. As long as there was risk involved, in it, and people were willing to take that risk, they were getting paid for that. Right. Yeah. That's what that's what that price and that limited supply brought. Right. We all wanted legalization. Well, with legalization, you get normalization, and with normalization, it becomes part of the economic system. So. As much as we'd like it to be culture, I'd rather, you know, you know, within the culture, I'd rather have this culture expand to become norm normalized, just as you, normalized culture in the United States. And there are mm -hmm. some aspects of it that we have to expect, and that is a certain amount of concentration and a certain amount of um, uh, big business in being involved in it. Um, in your recent article on the endogenous cannabinoid system, um, you say um, this physiological system, the ECS, is responsible for maintaining homeostasis throughout the body at a cellular level. When do you think that medical schools are going to start training people in the ECS? And when do you think doctors are going to be required to have training on the ECS uh, after they're practicing? Well, I, I don't necessarily have high hopes for it for this reason. Mm. They they don't teach about nutrition. Yeah. Right. They haven't even gotten there yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you notice uh, that the hippie, you know, they call it the Mediterranean diet. Right. But it's not, you know, the Mediterranean diet has a lot more bread and pasta. And, uh, you know, so it has a lot more uh, grains in it. Uh, than um, and oils than the hippie diet. Mm -hmm. So it, you know the hippie diet was, you know, more vegetables, lean meat, you know, right. non-red meat and things like that. And you know, my people like my brother who thought he was on a healthy diet, they scoffed at my dietary limitations. You know, because uh, you know it's primarily vegetables, fruit, and uh, fish, and, uh, and uh, fowl. Right. 
right. a mammal. Uh -huh. And, and um, now the doctor has him on that diet. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah, hard to, well, you know, it's, no one's a prophet in his own homeland, Ed. The stigma is still there, and and people, you know, uh, other than CBD being kind of a gateway, um, how do we get through to uh, you know just people around us, everyday people who aren't exposed to uh, people like us who you know enjoy and live with cannabis on a daily basis, not getting stoned? <laughs> I think that you first of all. Um, I should say that um, I'm on a longitudinal, I'm in a longitudinal study of one. Uh -huh. How marijuana affects a person over a lifetime of use. Right. And uh, results aren't in yet. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing about marijuana as uh, like, first of all, if you notice that people that, patients are way ahead of doctors in terms of use of CBD. Right. So the doctors, and it's sort of like what happened with computers. You know, people, there were, there were manufacturers of computers and they had no idea about how the breadth of how they would be used uh, by society in every aspect of their uh, lives, right? So, uh, and the same thing with CBD, that people are just experimenting with it. And so uh, we're in a, 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 a million patient experiment yeah. with, with CBD. Like a giant Birmingham study. Pets. I mean, you go to the pet, Pet store, pets. They have CBD for pets, right? Yep. And so I think that the people are way ahead of both the politicians and the, and the uh, and uh, the medical profession as as a whole. But yeah. here's the thing: I disagree with what you say about that uh, that there's not any kind of shame or any kind of negativity about cannabis? I don't. I don't think so. You look at the voting, and remember that marijuana is more popular than any politician. You just look at That's the That's a true story. Right? That's yeah. a true story. So, so I think that in saying that you're trying to normalize it among the general population, it's not the general public that you have to first that you have to uh, um, whose minds you have to change. It is the politicians and uh, and the professional establishment that hasn't gotten their piece of it. And yes, uh -huh. has a piece of it. Oh, is it safe? Oh, well, we have to They're check piece to of it. make sure that it's safe. Is oh, more it, studies, it's more safe. studies. Well, right. More studies. Right, we need a lot more studies. And so, uh, but, but may, meanwhile, the general public literally has voted and said, we want legal marijuana. And yeah. so whether people use it or not isn't the question. It's whether people have the right to use it. But I would also like to see, make sure that the taxes include the cost to society of the use of intoxicants. Yeah. So that would make marijuana far and far, by, by far the most used uh, intoxicant. We could just show the amount of uh, liver, kidney, brain, and heart damage, yeah. and we can put an actual cost on it sure. to the individual and to society for the cost of uh, dealing with these conditions. And so it would be uh, it would be billions and billions of dollars, and it would raise the cost of alcohol considerably. Well, you could you could ex and you could extrapolate that to opioids and its effect on uh, on, on on everything. You know, I mean, it's, well, it's actually, you know the, the family that are, owns Purdue, they're being sued personally now. Yeah, that's right. Good. They should be. Yeah, and I mean, they should be put in prison. Well, it should happen to them. Their wealth should be confiscated. And they should yeah. be put in prison. Yeah. And the names should be taken off all the public buildings and all the 
cultural centers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then if you get to tobacco, that too. And you know, don't let people tell you that. You know, you'll get uh, these people who say, "Oh, I smoke some tobacco that doesn't have chemicals, so it doesn't." Right. That's that is not true. Ting Ting. In 1607, mm. had an epistle against tobacco. Mm. He said, basically, in the terms that they understood in those days, that it causes cancer, heart conditions, foul smell, uh, 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 jaw, um, gum damage. That was in 1607. And Sir Walter Raleigh said, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm all in on tobacco. <laughs> he got his head cut off. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if Boehner's going to get his, his head cut off, but he's certainly going to make a, money, a lot of money on cannabis being part of Acreage Holdings. You know, you know what else he's doing? He's uh, uh, giving these seminars or he's involved in these seminars. Investing. That are, that are being advertised on AM radio. We point out the irony every week of what's going on with uh, John Boehner and friends. The Democrats lost the election in 2000, the Gore election. Right. He said marijuana has no medical use. Uh-huh. And if he had said we should investigate to see if marijuana has best medical use, not say it does. He could have just said, well, we should investigate that. Right. And I'll have a commission to look into it. If he had said that, he would have won the election. You're probably right. I agree 100%. Yeah. I didn't think about it then, but I certainly agree now. And then, uh, then take Hillary. Yeah. Not yeah. a nary a word. Yeah. And now in the Times, I have the article. It says in 2020, 2020 it's, the Democrats are going to be uh, pro pot. Yeah, well, they all are. Well, how nice of them. It's really good. I'm, I'm so happy. That they found hot. Yeah, we should give them a little golf clap. Yeah, yeah. Little, <laughs> Here you yeah. go, Democrats. They're yeah, just great. It's just great. I mean, it's definitely, we talked about it early on in our show, uh, that it's going to be 2018, uh, 20, rather 2018 and 2020 are going to be, cannabis is going to be one of the top issues. Um, and, you know, Bernie Sanders has taken credit for it, that he was talking about it four years ago. Uh, we just saw him here in L.A., uh, and he, he said it. At, he says it at every rally now that his was one of his ideas four years ago. <laughs> his idea about it in like 1967. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See, right after the Vietnam War ended. Yeah. Then we got into. Then the yippies got into pop. And and Nixon and Nixon went after it, man. Nixon went after you guys, well, all you guys. Drug, you know. A Jewish drug. That's yeah. what, well, what's the story? What's going on? What is the story behind that? How, How did, did you, a bunch of guys from New York become you guys? Become the the masters of and why did Nixon our cannabis so much? Who, did, who became masters of cannabis? You, you guys. I mean, all of you guys that came out of the uh, of the yippies and all of that a era. Bunch of guys from New York. A bunch of guys. You among them. Yeah. You, you oh, mean you like Steve it. D'Angelo? Yeah, all y'all uh, from New York. Everybody, everybody that, that that came out to California essentially when the you know the Controlled Substances Act was. Uh, yeah, yes. and yeah, a little bit. Yes, uh, Jack, 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 Her Her Jack, Jack yeah. Herrer, all of the, and then all of the strains. You guys created everything. You know, I mean, how did that happen? Why? What? How what drove you guys? Back? How did this happen? Well, hot for pennies. Hot for pennies. Overgrow the government. It was really an act of a revolutionary act. Yeah. Yeah, so um, changes and, the world. At the heart, the yippies in New York, this a core group: Tom Frassad, uh Dana Beal, myself, some other people, uh, Ben Mazel. All all those people uh, and others who have passed away. Uh, it was a core group that was at, at the heart of it, both intellectual and activist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, and uh, like 
when we were doing the paper, the Yipster Times, um, I was considered the one least likely to ever be able to write. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> the show that you'll, you'll show them. <laughs> Here's a textbook for you. <laughs> Lena became a poet. A.J. Weberman wrote books on um, like Coup d'etat in America, which I published. Yeah. Has actual photos of the uh, assassins, the Kennedy assassins. Wow. Um, in it. Um, yeah. Revolutionaries. Intellectual, pretty intellectual group. Yeah, revolutionaries. Dana Beal. Dana Beal. Helped to start uh, the Ibo game thing. I I helped um, with that a little bit. Yeah. What do you think about the new uh, the push with MDMA and psilocybin being on the breakthrough therapy list, and now we see local decriminalization efforts? If if I were a war like capitalist, I don't know that I'd appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in Oregon, they're going to make, they're going to vote on mushrooms. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, and it is on the FDA's breakthrough therapy list, and it's being fast tracked for a treatment for depression. You know, I, I mean, like people hand it out now, like they used to hand out. Uh, how's it going? Hey, want want some mushrooms? So what's our what's what's coming up for you? What are you doing now? What are you working on? Are you working on another book? Uh, I have a number of books out. Yes. Uh, on new, uh, there's uh, uh, last year I did uh, the book Harvest, and this year, uh, or and also last year, or the year, and also last year I came out with uh, Beyond Buds Next Generation. Right. Uh, pretty good reviews and has good sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the book Marijuana Garden Saver. I've ex expanded that book and updated it. And so that book will it's at the press right now. I should say that one thing that I'm working on is there's a there's a, there's a person who's uh, there are several people uh, that I know of who uh, I'm working with to put out a book on how to grow mushrooms on things like uh, cardboard. Ah. Uh. Yes, because I am overwhelmed by the, by that book as well. <laughs> on the, on the, the on growing the psilocybin, uh, and that it looks, but that's that sounds intriguing. Uh, we like, look forward to seeing that one when that comes out. Yeah, and maybe hearing more about it right when it comes out. Maybe you could come back and talk to us more about it then. Yeah. So thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, any final thoughts on where we go from here in in the world of politics? What do we, uh, what what should we be pushing for? Of course, you know because backyard grows are all being oppressed. How do we reach our politicians? That's, How do we reach them? How do we reach the doctors? How do we reach that status quo establishment? How do we get them to turn around on it? You know, uh, police oppression. I know that it comes down on some people harder than others. Yeah. But um, um, but let's say you didn't have that, then yes. you wouldn't. Then you wouldn't realize that you have to fight for your freedom. Nobody gives it to you. Right. I'm hearing civil disobedience. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Keep growing. And negative liberty. And negative liberty. Keep growing. Uh, not liberty that's given to you or, or you have to fight for. Keep growing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we really would love to talk to you again uh, in the future. So Maybe thank in you. Person. Yeah. Yes, that would be great. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.